right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. I'm Jeff Edwards. I work for the University of Wyoming Extension. Uh, I'm stationed in Goshen County, Wyoming. And uh, my co-host back with us again today is Jeremiah Vardaman. Hello, Jeremiah. Hello, how are we doing? Very good. Jeremiah is up in the northern side of the state in Park County, extension educator up there for the University of Wyoming Extension. Also uh, behind the scenes is Jenny Thompson. She's the University of Wyoming specialist. Uh, she's located in Laramie and she is keeping us on track. It's always good to have things work like they should, right, Jenny? <laughs> oh, she's muted, so we'll, we'll <laughs> keep going. Um, put her on the spot. And uh, our guest today uh, is Ted Craig. He is the grants manager for the universe, excuse me, the grants manager for Wyoming Department of Agriculture. And um, we are going to spend our program today talking about season extension, hoop houses, high tunnels, and hopefully get the geodesic domes. So uh, um, Ted, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and uh, wherever you want to start. How, first of all, how did we, you know, we've been, you and I have been working together for the last 10 years on high tunnels and hoop houses and those types of things. Uh, how did we start doing this 10 years ago? Hold on. Hold on. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot, didn't I? <laughs> you did, you forgot. Um, I just want to throw it out there for all the participants. Uh, probably most of you know, but if you don't, throw your questions into the Q&A box and Jeff and I will try and filter those into the, the show as we can. Uh, if you're on Facebook Live, please put those in the comments and Jenny will try and bring those to us as well. So sorry for the interruption. Let's go. Let's go, Ted. Okay. All right. So we've been doing these types of things, these workshops for the last, well, 11 years now, I think. Um, how did we get started doing them, Ted? Well, that was a suggestion of the then Department of Ag uh, Director. And he said he had just been to a, uh, a workshop by this guy named Del Jimenez down in New Mexico. And he was building hoop houses. Oh, hold on your sound, oh, your sound, on quality. Your sound. quality. You're breaking up a little. I'm breaking up? Yeah. yeah. Try it again. Okay. Well, we, we started about 10 years ago at the suggestion of the then Department of Ag director. Uh, it's been to a workshop. And his suggestion was, you know, I was down in New Mexico and I went to this workshop on how to build hoop houses and we built one. And he said, we should do that in Wyoming. And so that's kind of the beginnings of the, the, the I guess, the workshops that started in, in Wyoming back in, it was actually, it was like 2008, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, a while ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... so. So Ted, uh, so you uh, you found some game. funding um, yes. through the USDA, correct? And it was a yes. specialty crop block grant. Yes, uh, the, that, that was just ahead. starting at, at in two thousand eight. Yeah. Okay. So, and the focus of uh, these particular grants was to figure out and understand how to extend the growing season uh, in Wyoming right. and other states because it was nationally available. Um, so I, for, for whatever reason, Ted and I got connected on these things and, um, it's kind of mushroomed, <laughs> blossomed. <laughs> so where did you guys start with the project once you brought it back to Wyoming? Did you, did you just start throwing up high tunnels everywhere? Pretty much. <laughs> we, we started in Casper at the Farmers Market Association Conference. We actually had Jeff uh, or uh, Del Jimenez come up and, and do a workshop and that's kind of where we saw how he was doing them and you know went from there. I mean then it's we did them at a couple of other conferences and then you know started to get requests from nonprofits and schools and um, you know it, it just kind of happened. And, so, um, uh, Dell, his, his production strategy, you know, we might as well start at the beginning, right? His production strategy, strategy in New Mexico is a little bit different than ours. They will actually use a hoop house to grow completely through the wintertime and then harvest in the early spring. 
and then allow those hoop houses to fallow because it's just so darn hot in the winter or in the summer. Um, so uh, our uh, experiences, on the other hand, our goal was just to be able to extend the growing season and protect these high dollar crops, these specialty crops, to allow them to mature and produce and then maybe bring things out to farmers markets and those types of things a little bit earlier. Um, and Ted, one of the things that we realized very early on is that much of the hoop house research that was being done in the nation was in places where they don't get as much sun as we get. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the data would tell us that, um, you know, traditionally you can get 30 days extension on either end of the growing season. Um, where we are in Wyoming and we get more sunny days, we are practically able to produce all year round in some locations. Uh, so just one skin of material, no additional heat, no, uh, it, it's a passive system. Um, and uh, we can grow and produce these crops that the grant was interested in um, uh, expanding the resources. So right. just real quick, uh, just for some folks that are on or people like me that are ignorant, right? <laughs> High tunnel and hoop house. Can you just kind of define those? What are they? You kind of touched on it a bit as a passive one skin system, but is Go there ahead. a definition to it? A definition? Well, they're they're basically the same thing. I mean, okay. you know, you have poly tunnels. You you know, they're they're called so many different things. Uh, cold frame greenhouses. Um, you know, it's just all in the terms that, you know, whoever's using what term, but a hoop house and a high tunnel are really the same. Uh, and the primary difference from a hoop house and a high tunnel to a low tunnel is that a hoop house and high tunnel you can walk into and farm, right? Instead of needing to lift the cover to get in to do the work that you need to do. So the so structure, structure you can physically walk into, I think. Right. So, so the uh, the high tunnels and hoop houses. The original structure that we started building was uh, um, uh, twelve by thirty-two, I believe, or twelve by thirty-eight, something like that. Um, and Dell's uh, practices principles um, was to build them as inexpensively as possible which sort of works for us, but uh, because of our weather, because of the wind um, and uh, snow load that we have, uh, we had to beef them up significantly. And the structures that we were building last year or two years ago were much different than the ones that we were building at the beginning. So Ted, do you wanna talk about the three different structures that we first brought to Wyoming? Hold on, hold on. Before we get there, we oh, have a quick question. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so Megan asked, what about quick build caterpillar tunnels? You might want to hold that to, for later and talk about the different types and then work into that. Okay. Is it, okay, I was not clear. I don't know what a caterpillar tunnel is, so I'm going to learn something. Now. But go ahead, Ted. We'll catch it in a minute. Okay. The first ones we started building were, were and it's based on, on uh, dimension of materials. It was a 20 foot stick of uh, PVC. So the, and that lent itself to a, a, a 12 foot wide hoop house. And it go, it's about seven and a half feet tall. And they're really, really pretty simple to put up. I mean, they're the most simple thing you could possibly do other than a caterpillar tunnel, which is less, less uh, has requirements there, but, um, but, um, we did a 12 by 32 and you know it's kind of the workhorse for New Mexico it's because it's easy to build very inexpensive um, and can go up very quickly and you know you can put one up in a day I mean so easily. Ted by 12 by 32 you mean 12 feet by 32 feet right 12 foot wide 32 feet long with and I and I think the original materials list that Dell used uh, those structures cost about twelve hundred dollars if I remember correctly wow. yeah yeah so you could you could be farming in a decent sized area um, and protecting that crop for very little money however <laughs> yeah well 
um, you know, and that's and it and it's a it's a it's a pretty strong structure. I mean, it it uh, it takes a lot to to uh, to crush it, but um, but then we had like the, I changed the background here to what's called a Gothic style. And that was that was Dell's next one, and uh, he because he wanted more room for the same amount of price. Right. Uh, yeah, and the the big problem is that. It works really well in New Mexico, but our snow load in Wyoming is too great. And uh, <clears throat> well, of the ones that I forget, we probably built what eight of them, and, and probably well, seven of the seven of the eight have since been crushed by snow load. I um, know of one remaining, and that's in Wheatland, Wyoming. And the guys over there have beefed it up so much that there's uh, so much in in uh internal um bracing that i don't think king kong could crush it so <laughs> so the main difference between the gothic style and your usual like rounded hoop house is that you have like a flatter roof is that the main difference it's a little hard to tell in your picture it's yeah it's a flatter roof and it, it has a little more square footage because you're now i believe it's 15 foot uh if i remember right uh, uh 17 17 wide 17 Okay, 17 by 32. So it, it has a lot more room, but unfortunately, from a longevity standpoint, it's not as uh, structurally sound. We, we do not recommend building this type of PVC structure in Wyoming. No. no. <laughs> what would happen sure. is, what would happen is we'd have those late season, really heavy, wet snows, and the snow just kind of piles up on these and they crush, and then the wind blows so then the whole thing just kind of disappears. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jer I think so, Jeremiah experienced that. I, yeah, yeah, it wasn't a Gothic style uh, tunnel, but it, yeah, it are just, we got a heavy wet snow in the spring and it just zipped the whole plastic right off. We were fortunate it was a metal framed high tunnel. Oh, okay. So it was one of those kits that we purchased it um, from a company, put up the metal frame. And so the metal frame was fine. It, it weathered the storm fine, but it just destroyed the plastic on it. Um, and we, it was that clear poly plastic. Um, it was not oh, that, yeah. um, woven. Fiber reinforced. Yeah. 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 And um, you know, so maybe, maybe this is a good time to mention the fiber reinforced that. Yes. Uh, for Wyoming, because we we uh, were uh, warned early on that 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 the uh, the clear film, if you get a a uh, cut in it or a rip in it that before you know it it goes from one end of the, the hoop house all the way to the other and and there are many producers can who have uh, built the uh, hoop houses that can attest to that that oh there was a little rip you know in the morning and by night the whole the rip has gone you know 40 50 feet and right. they're having to replace the uh, the cover well with the fiber reinforced if you get a little rip in it it doesn't go anywhere you can you can Just repair it which um, I, I can attest to, we, we, built, we built a modified structure that Ted is going to talk about next. Uh, it was 24 feet wide and 72 feet long. I think the day after we got it skinned, we, in Torrington, we had a uh, hailstorm. Uh, and this was not, it was not um, uh, round hail. This was large slabs of hail. And uh, one of them came in at an angle and put a nine inch rip in the top of that cover. Uh, this particular one, I think we built it in 2010 or 2011. Um, right. That rip has not traveled. The original skin is still on that structure. So uh, it is showing its age now, but um, uh, it, that's the nice thing. You get a hole or two, they aren't going to travel like the, the traditional poly film. We had uh, also that same high tunnel that lost the cover. Uh, we, we just got the structure up and uh, that fall a little little buck deer came through and stuck his antlers through that poly film, just feeling ornery, I guess, put mm -hmm. a big old hole in the side of it and that. And so we had to reskin the end wall of the high tunnel. Uh, but yeah, anything could damage it and it just, we couldn't salvage it. Yeah, I think- it was uh, like I Clear I poly think, plastic. I think I might've said bad words in that type of instant, Jeremiah. <laughs> I was just like, oh, well, go, go figure. <laughs> it's just how it goes. 
So Ted, on the picture behind you, you have, it looks like straps going over across that particular structure. What are the, what's that all about? That's to keep your, uh, your plastic from flapping because if, if you can keep your plastic tight, um, you won't have the uh, wear on the ribs. Because if you have wear on the ribs, it's, in Wyoming, we get a lot of, you know, a lot of wind and there's, there's a lot of dust and dust can get up underneath and then it starts acting you're breaking plastic. up a little bit. You're, you're it will wear out the plastic on the ribs if because of the the grit that uh, gets blown in by the Wyoming wind. So you want to keep the, the plastic tight, and that's one way of, of helping keep the plastic tight. You want to try and get it as tight as you can to begin with, but then by putting those straps over, you you add some more tension to it and, and keep things from moving around so that they don't act like a, a sandpaper. Well, and the, the other thing is, we didn't think about this when we were building this Gothic style, is that when the uh, PVC joints that we use come out of the mold, they have a little nipple on the end that is facing the plastic. And I don't think we ever ground that off. And it was one of the first places where the, um, the dome would wear through is on these ribs where that plastic piece was sticking up. So yeah. at the corner, yeah. a question in the chat box here. Uh, will there be a list, this comes from Mike, will there be a list of recommended supplies for building these? Do you have a publication or something we can attach and put on the website, Jeff? So I have a website that's the uh, Wyoming Hoop House Information Network. I apologize, it hasn't been updated for quite a while, but we do have information out there on all three of these particular um, uh, styles. Um, materials lists and instruction manuals on how to build them. So um, so you can get there if you go to our barn, backyard and barnyards in Wyoming, you can just Google for it and find our site. And if you go to the gardening page, you pull that up and you go down to season extension. We have a link to a bunch of different articles, including one called 101 Ways for a, a High Tunnel to Die, which has super good tips mm -hmm. on how to build them so they'll survive our particular weather conditions. But this is the one that Jeff is talking about, the Wyoming Hoop House Information Network. If you click on that, it'll take you to his site. And again, I apologize that it hasn't been updated in a while, but um, uh, it has the information there that you would need for materials and how to build these individual structures. We have another question in the chat box. Uh, Kyla asks, will most commercial kits require some modification in order to survive here? Is DIY the better option as far as cost to durability? Can, can I take that, Ted? Or if I miss something, you want to jump in? Okay, you go ahead and I'll jump in when I, with my you know, with my thoughts. Okay, so um, many of the kits that you can purchase either have zippered doors or Velcroed doors. Um, don't use them <laughs> because they will last about a month and blow out and something, maybe your high tunnel may even entirely disappear at that point in time. Um, really need to beef up the ends and uh, the door structures. Uh, the kits are generally quite a bit more expensive um, so they can be cost prohibitive. Uh, so, you know, you really, if that's something that you're interested in, just because it might be a little more convenient for you, uh, go ahead, but um, just be aware that you may have to beef it up for our environment. Ted, is there anything else that you would like to add? The other thing is, is that uh, some of the kits, their, their instructions on how to attach the plastics, um, there's been a lot of a lot of people who've bought kits and they lose their covers, uh, which is you know um, because they're 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 not telling you that you know in Wyoming gets some pretty decent winds. I mean I've seen uh, you know I obviously nothing is immune from destruction, but you try and build in as many things as you possibly can to keep one your cover on and two things from getting crushed. And so that's, you know, uh, that would be my recommendation. Plus the other thing, a lot of the kits come with just, you know, the, the clear film, they don't come with fiber reinforced. So you may be purchasing a kit, but you may not be getting the best materials that you can buy because it comes as a kit. 
Speaking of building them, we have a question from Facebook from Carla. She says, good information. I live in a subdivision that doesn't allow prefab or plaster covered greenhouses. Can these hoop houses be built with plexiglass? They can be, be very expensive. Um, be very expensive. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, is they might allow polycarbonate. You could check on that, which is a kind of a, uh, a cross between the uh, plexiglass and, and a, a plastic film. So that would be, yeah, go back and ask. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a strong yes. structure. So my experience anyway, uh, I put up two of those commercial kits um, and the metal ribbing, the metal framing was extremely durable, did really, really well. Um, as Jeff and Ted have pointed out, uh, we got the clear poly uh, plastic. And so if you can upgrade to the woven plastic, that reinforced is a lot better. Um, the zippers did blow out. Uh, you can't keep those ends tight enough with the zipper or the Velcro. Um, and we, we took four by four timbers, uh, treated timbers on the ends to secure the end walls um, and, and, and put, pounded those in the ground and then anchored those. And then that was a way to reinforce those end walls so they didn't have any flex and vibration to them like Ted was talking about. And then also gave us an option to put a door on it as well. Ted and Jeff, I don't think you mentioned how many you put up across the state through the years so that people have a kind of idea of your experimentation I think, I think ted's number differs from mine a little bit but um we've uh i think we're really close to 90 uh around the state uh, is that close to the number that you have ted yeah but i think it's over 100 <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels like 100 <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been a lot so one of the things that we haven't touched on yet is um venting these structures um, because they do get very, if you leave them closed up, they do get very warm. Um, it's very easy for on a 50 degree day outside temperature for the temperature on the inside to be 110 very, very easily. So, uh, venting is very important. And the, the, um, structures that we learned how to build in New Mexico, the whole side would roll up from the bottom, from the ground level up to that point that you can see behind Ted where that, uh, that purlin goes, right? Right between his ears. <laughs> that, that wood yeah. part. Yeah. yeah, that wood, stuff that looks like wood. In fact, that, is, that does have a roll up side on it there. Yeah, but in Wyoming, since the wind blows and we're trying to grow very early on in the season, we felt that it was important to try to raise that um, uh, opening up so that the cool spring breezes that we get wouldn't be blowing directly on the plants when you opened up that side. So we've actually uh, put a, I think it was about a four foot skirt all the way around and then um, allowed the roll up side to overlap that. And once it's warm enough in the season, then we roll up the, roll up the side, leave it up, uh, for all season long and then when it starts getting cool again in the fall we would roll that down nightly because this is a passive system whatever the temperature is outside at night will be the temperature on the inside of the structure um, and to continue to grow even further on you can use things like uh, floating row cover and other means to protect the crop so um, that's how we get to grow through the entire season so, so along that line one negative thing about Oh, I was just going to say along that line, we have a question from Trent. Um, so he was going back to when you said you could grow stuff almost year round. Are you implying temperatures stay consistent or are you rotating crops warm to cold weather plants? So growing crops and growing something <clears throat> all year round, um, you're not going to be able to grow the traditional things. Well, let me back up. In Torrington, we were able to grow almost all year round. Um, and again, you're not able to grow things that you think you can around the year. It'll be things like spinach and greens and things that are cold tolerant. Um, but then again, at nighttime, you need to cover them up because they will freeze. Um, so, and if you get a long period of time where it's cold and cloudy and the, the, the high tunnel can't warm up to sustain itself, 
th that crop will be done. So it's, it's dependent on the year and it depends on how well you insulate that crop throughout the winter. And we were able to harvest greens maybe once a month. It wasn't a lot of production, but at least you were able to have a fresh green salad once a month in January, December, January, and February, March, uh, January, February. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to be getting tomatoes in January. No. You know, they'll be gone. So I have a commercial producer up here in, in between Cody and Powell, and I believe they're up to nine of these high tunnel structures, and they're big. They're the large ones, maybe 30 foot wide by 90 foot long. Uh, and they're the kits that you would purchase commercially. And then they're reinforced kind of like what Ted has behind him. Um, and he grows nine months of the year. I think he wants three months of rest for all that high production. But also, right. at least to him, he can still grow in those three months, January, February, March, or excuse me, December, January, February. But he does not feel that there's enough day length up here to get those plants to actively produce and actively grow. And thus, on the commercial side of things, it's, it's not worth it being open and pushing those, that production. And it allows you to get under control any insect problems that you might have developed over the growing season. So that's the other benefit of taking a break. <clears throat> so a couple things. Yeah. Um, so one thing I just wanted to clarify. So in, in the springtime, you're rolling those sides up in the daytime and closing them at night if daytime temperatures are warm enough, correct? Yes. And then again, that happened. And then in the summertime, once temperatures get warm enough and stay warm enough, so maybe above 60 degrees as a rule of thumb, you're rolling them up and leaving them up. And I mean low temperature of 60. Yeah, so uh, when it's 40 degrees at night, I'll roll it up and leave it up. Okay. But, it, but again, it depends, um, it depends on What's how, early, how early you started planting and what types of crops you have in there. So um, my wife and I were able to start planting the first day of spring this year in March. Uh, then we planted some things in April, and then we planted some things in May. Um, but uh, I have tomatoes that are blooming at this point in time. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't think that's ever happened for us before. Um, so, and I think I have an image here someplace behind me. This, everything behind me is uh, two days ago in my high tunnel. So, uh, wow. Right. But then in the fall, you follow the same pattern as the spring, right? So you're rolling the sides up in the daytime when it's warm enough and down at night or in the days where it's not warm enough, that kind of thing, correct? Correct. We, we pay attention to the temperature. We try to, you know, manage and make sure that we're not going to lose things. And if it does get really cold at night, we will cover things as well. Okay. With low tunnels or floating row covers? Uh, floating row cover or um, cloches, I think is what they're called. Uh, Maybe Ted can pronounce that better for me. You did a pretty good job. You know. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So I got to catch up on a few questions here. Megan asked, what is the average temperature increase do you get with this, with Ooh. a high tunnel? It can be significant. You, you can, if you do not vent the high tunnel, you can make salsa hanging on the plant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think Jeremiah has experienced this. Yeah. Um, I think it could easily get to 150 degrees inside one of these structures in the heat of the day if you do not vent it. In the uh, peak of summer. In the peak when of summer. I, when I was in Mexico in, in July, I, I uh, opened up one of the, the uh, hoop houses that they built on the Alcalde research station. And I thought I was opening an oven. I mean, it was, it was you know, it... It was so hot. I couldn't believe how hot it was. And they were growing savanna grass in there. And it was, grass was doing great, but, uh, but just you would, you would die going in if you had to be in that for very long. And, so. and so there's, you know, there's an optimal temperature for everything to grow. And usually anything above 85 plants start shutting down, uh, just protecting themselves. And so, uh, it's one of those things that you're going to have to figure out how to manage. People, people always ask, "What is the, uh, what, what's the workload with one of these things?" Right. Well, if you're a gardener, you're still going to have to pull weeds. You're still going to have to do things. You're, um, so, 
is it more than a traditional garden? I don't think so, but it's longer, right? So, but by September, you're thinking, oh, geez, I wish it would freeze. <laughs> so, so Megan, Megan has a, uh, and Megan has a follow-up question to that. Also, do you use passive heating via water or compost? No, but you can. Uh, I don't personally. Um, there are individuals around the state uh, there's a gentleman up in um, Sundance, I believe, who has a uh, 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 heat system in his raised beds. Uh, I think he's using eth ethylene glycol in uh, tubing and warming that up to increase the temperature of his beds to get things to germinate quicker in the spring. Um, so there are many different tactics that you can do um, to retain heat. Uh, we've actually looked at this in Laramie. Uh, we did a three-year trial looking at ways to increase heat retention. And what it came down to is probably the best thing that you can do is add another layer of plastic. Yeah. It, mo it moderates, so you'll have two layers of plastic on the structure. It moderates the temperature, takes a little longer for things to heat up, takes a little longer for things to cool down. Um, so that it seemed to be the best. Speaking of that, we have a question from Trent asking, um, has anyone attempted a double wall high tunnel to increase the temperature even further? That, yeah. yeah, I guess yes. you just yes. answered that. But, it's, but it wouldn't be to increase have, the temperature. Yep, yep. Would, it's to retain would you say about a 20 degree difference then? Inside to outside on in, the, the, uh, in the colder season? On the double wall? I, I don't know if I can answer that question, Ted. I, uh, it just, um, what our study showed was that it took longer for the double walled one to cool down. I can't give you a temperature exactly. range. Yeah. So, but it still reached the low temperature for the night without supplemental heat. Right. It depends upon how cold it is outside too. So, you know, that's... 30, 30 below yeah. is 30 below. It, it is yeah. entirely... <laughs> It is. It's going to get there. Yeah. But yeah. The double wall uh, high tunnel basically adds an insulation factor to the high tunnel. So it's slower to warm up first off, and then it's slower to cool down. But you still reach peak temperatures on both spectrums the high temperature and then the low temperature. Right. Yes. Yes. Hopefully yeah. that. And hopefully the, the, the night ends before it gets to the point where you're, you're going to freeze. So. <laughs> We have a question related to wind and beating up your high tunnel. Um, Lori from Facebook says we put up a 30 by 48 high tunnel in the fall. So this is our first season. When the wind is high, is it better to leave the hoop house open or shut? Open the ends or sides or some kind of combination? To me, it depends on what the temperature of the day is going to be. Um, if the wind is going to blow and that you can tolerate the temperature that it's at, I would open it up completely or shut it completely. But not Ed? in between. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the, the biggest people make is they'll open up one area, but not allow for the wind to, to, uh, to get out. So they, if they open up one end, they better open up the other end because you gotta have somewhere for that wind to go. And part Otherwise, of it, it will balloon and disappear. It will blow away. Yeah. So does part of it also depend on your orientation of your hoop house? That according to which way the wind is blowing? You know, it, 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 um, there's a couple of things there. The, the, the amount of light you want in and the, like for the smaller ones, the, the, the 12 footers, um, you can get away with not having roll up sides by making sure that you orient it so that it's with the prevailing wind. So that, uh, yeah, so that you can put it on both ends and it will, will cool itself in the summer, even on the hottest days, if you keep both ends open. But larger ones, it gets a little bit more larger. larger usually, typically a larger high tunnel or who, uh, will moderate the temperature better than a low low uh, a, a smaller high tunnel. So uh, it, it's it's very similar to uh, the turn of a lake. A larger body of water takes longer to heat and cool 
as opposed to a smaller body of water. It's the same type of principle with air inside a trapped space. <clears throat> so we have a, a question and it's, I, th there's not a name associated with it. It's just a um, BCEP basically. Um, so what materials for double wall? One fiber reinforced and then one clear polyplastic. Do both need to be reinforced if you did the double wall system? You know, that's, that's uh, like we've been using a, a, a double wall plastic 11 mil on the outer one. You don't need to, uh, if you're going to do a double wall, you don't need the, to spend the amount of money on the inner wall that you do on the outer, outer, outer plastic uh, skin. Um, you can get away with a, a, you know, a six mil or even a four mil. Uh, you know, six mil is what you'll find. And, it, you know, Jeff, I'm, I, I don't have an, any problem with doing a, a clear plastic on the inside um, because it's I don't not either. Gonna get, uh, it's going to get you know protected by the outer one. So yeah, you I mean, would. We've you, used we've used both. So you know a, a, a thinner wall or a thinner uh, milled plastic on the inside, uh, fiber reinforced or non-fiber reinforced. So if yeah, you it's just the outer one. Yeah. It would be the one that you need to have fiber reinforced to protect from hail. The, while we're talking about double walling, um, traditionally in greenhouses uh, that are for commercial production, they will, they will put um, uh, a blower of some type in between two layers to make sure that the, the, uh, there's a pillow of air in there to help insulate it. It's really, di it's really difficult to do that in a hoop house uh, because you have these ribs that are holding it. So what you need to do is make a pillow of air in between each rib space. And to do that, what we've done is take that batten tape material that Jenny commented on. On the first layer, once you get it all attached and on, take the batten tape and put it very tightly between the inter-rib space so that you're pulling that first layer down between the two ribs. And then the second layer, uh, we have done a crisscross pattern between ribs so that it allows it to uh, have an air space in there that's, again, it's passive. Uh, and so you're adding to the insulative value of that skin. One of the things you have to realize, we've been trying to do these, one of the goals that was to how to do them as simply as possible. Um, and, and inexpensive. And inexpensively as possible, because every time you add something to, you know, your uh, your high tunnel, it's going to add costs. Uh, yeah. You know, single wall versus double wall, uh, a, a solar fan to vent it, uh, you know, solar vents, everything, you know, a shade cloth, everything adds adds uh, adds cost. And that's one of the things. So our our structures. Every every time we went out, we would build it to the site and maybe change something and say, okay, this worked, this worked a little bit better. So when we started out, we were building those structures that Del Jimenez built for $1,200. By the end, our projects cost about $3,000 to build a 16 by 32 structure. And part of that is uh, the venting. Um, we got to a point where we were able to purchase uh, automatic louvered vents uh, and get away from the roll-up sides somewhat um, because, okay, so it increased cost, but it also decreased labor. Um, and part of that is one of the big fail points on these structures, if you're not diligent about taking care of them, is the roll-up sides will get caught in the wind and peel completely off the structure. So uh, that's, you know, our our, we learn as we go, we build to the site, and that's kind of how our things have evolved. Right, and I think yeah. that's a very good point both of you have made. At least that's been my experience when I talk to people about these, uh, especially people that don't have one or looking at doing it. They, and I always make this comment, and I don't mean it insulting or anything, but they really want a greenhouse, but don't want the greenhouse price. Um, right. And mm -hmm. so, this is the what uh, what Ted and Jeff have talked about at this point is just the base structure, 
and you can accessorize or tweak out as much as you want. And, and you do need to kind of do that for your specific uh, goals and objectives of that high tunnel and then for your benefit, right? So for some people, rolling up sides up and down is not a big deal. I'm there anyway, I'm home. I can do that. But for myself, I'm at work during the day. And it would be really great if those alluvial fans just open and close by themselves. And I don't have to worry about that. Um, yeah, and if there's a day that you, that it gets really hot and you drove off and drove to work, but you had those vents in, it would protect the plants from cooking. It's still going to be uncomfortably warm in there, but it will so, keep them from. So we had a question about the vents and they're just asking if there is temperature sensitive vents, which you kind of covered. Um, can you talk about the different types of vents? I think you talked about, you had like a solar powered one. I've seen ones that have like a paraffin tube that reacts to heat that opens and closes. What, what, do you have recommendations on types of vents folks should use? So the passive vents have the paraffin tube that we've used and it works on a hinge system and it's uh, the, the substance inside the tube heats up and it pushes out a, a pin, which drives the opening mechanism for the vent. Um, and when it gets above 70 degrees, it starts to expand and open up. And when it gets below 70 degrees, it shuts and will shut the vent. Uh, the other thing that we've started to incorporate is a uh, solar powered fan. Um, and again, cost money, right? But uh, those types of things, if you can get the air moving through, if you're not around to adjust things, work great. Um, you've, there's just a, uh, we've been using a uh, 60 watt uh, attic, attic vent, I think is what it is. Um, just mounting it on the side near the peak of the structure, uh, just to move air out or through. Um, uh, do they get hot? Yes, they still get warm. It's best to do your work in them in the morning or in the late evening, uh, but it's not enough to cook the plants at that point. We have a brief question, it's kind of a yes or no one. Um, that's from some folks that are living in Chugwater and they have a 17 by 48 metal Gothic style frame that we're hoping to put up this summer. It came with a plastic cover, which we will replace with the fiber reinforced plastic and a shade cloth type cover as well. It did not come with the end walls. Does your site include instructions on how to build and connect end walls securely? Uh, not for a metal structure. <laughs> Correct, Ted? No, I, I, not really. I mean, why, you know, you're, you could, you could follow the design, but, um, you know, the, but not for the, that size of, uh, we don't have specific instructions for that size of, uh, of so it's, that. it's 17 by 48, uh, 17 wide, I'm assuming would be the end wall size. Um, I would use four by fours to frame the door mm -hmm. and then um, within that uh, figure out how to build inner spaces between the door frame. So maybe another, another vertical on the end and then mm -hmm. fill those spaces in so that you can attach the plastic to. If, if they want to or put their uh, contact information in the in the chat box, Jenny, and you capture that, I can give them a call and talk to them of how we did it with those metal kits that we put up. Great. Yeah. Some, so, some people are using plywood on the ends too. So, I mean, plywood's and right. just building a wall. Just totally enclose it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna catch a couple things up here on questions and then I'd like to move the conversation to geodesic domes. We had a request to really get to that today. So somebody's very interested in wanting to build one. Uh, I have considered, uh, this question comes from Megan, I have considered using it in the heat of the high summer to make compost via the Berkeley method. Does that seem viable? So again, getting back to that heating, uh, using a passive water system or a compost, is that a viable system? Jeff, I'll leave that one here for you. Oh, darn, I was hoping you'd answer that. <laughs> um, so I'm not familiar with the Berkeley system. Uh, we toured a high tunnel in Saratoga where they were making their own soil out of... Um, Jeremiah, were you on that trip? I was not. Okay. 
Uh, Jenny, you might have been on that trip where they were making their own soil out of uh, uh, straw and composting things. And, uh, you know, I don't, is it a viable way to create soil in your high tunnel? Yes, but I don't know about composting. Sorry. Yeah, I was on that trip, but I don't recall exactly. If it gives off any heat, uh, it would be, it would help in terms of supplemental heating. Is it enough? It really depends on how much you can generate. Is it beneficial to the plants? That kind of thing. Um, I don't know the Berkeley method, but that's just kind of off the top of my head. I'm not sure. Depends on the size of the structure, how much you did. It's going to be that heat exchange issue, but I think you're going to struggle to get over the coldest temperature. Yeah, but wasn't the, the question about composting in the summer, not necessarily in the winter? That could, let's see, I got to find it again. Sorry. Personally, I would not utilize the space in my high tunnel to compost. Yeah, I would yeah. compost on the outside just because the, the space on the inside of a high tunnel is very valuable production space. Um, but that's, that's just me. It might not work for you that way. Right. You are correct. It was in the, in the high summertime. The summer. So, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't, but that's just me. I, I wouldn't compost inside. So our next question is, uh, the, uh, Dara, I have a small backyard plot about 15 by 10, I'm guessing feet, in the city in Denver, Colorado. Is there a way to scale your model down to the size or would you suggest a different way to protect from the elements and extend the growing season? Yeah, so uh, you can build a 12 by 12 traditional hoop style uh, high tunnel. Um, it would fit quite nicely. Um, we have done um, demo. There's actually a, uh... Uh, Jeff, if I can interrupt, there's a, uh, a publication on that one too, how to do a 12 by 12. Okay. Um, and we could, you know, if we get capture the information, we can do uh, the, the materials list and how to do it. Yeah, if you send me the links, I'll connect them to the recording of this video and have them up on our web page. Okay, perfect. So Jeremiah, was that it? Are we going to start talking about domes now? I think, Jenny, have we caught up on everything? Um, the last, uh, just the follow up on Megan's question was yes, Berkeley method uses high heat to make compost in four weeks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I agree with Jeff, com Jeff's comments on that. Of, you don't want to take up your gardening space in a high tunnel to do compost. It's just expensive and, and valuable growing space. However, if you have the room and the desire, you could build a high tunnel just for composting. Yeah, that for composting, yeah. Um, yeah, the, try it. Um, uh, it. It's hot. It's a good space. If that's what you want to do or use your hoop house or high tunnel for, try it. Let us oh. know how it works out. We haven't caught up with all the questions, but I think we should head on to the geodomes to talk about that a little bit so we'll have time. But I'll save the questions and if we have time at the end, I'll feed them in then. Otherwise, we'll be here for two days. Ted, did you want me to share your, your uh, presentation that you sent me? Sure. Okay. Give me, talk about something because I have to find it. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, one of the reasons that, you know, we, we uh, started building uh, geodesic greenhouse uh, or geodesic dome greenhouses was we had a couple instances in extremely high wind areas where, you know, hoop houses fail. I mean, they just, you know, uh, it didn't matter whether or not it was a, PVC hoop house or a, a, a kid hoop house, uh, they just got crushed by the wind. And in some cases with our, our uh, uh, you know, there was some really uh, bad issues with you know, four feet or five feet of snow trying to crush things. So we thought, you know, there's gotta be something else out there that, you know, will withstand, um, you know, the wind and also the snow. Well, you know, we decided that, you know, people are, you know, we, we started doing some research and they said, hey, domes, you know, domes are an, an incredibly strong structure. They don't require any internal bracing. Uh, they're really good on, on shipping wind. They'll, they're really good at, at uh, um, keeping, not collapsing under snow load. Um, so 
we we said, okay, well, we're going to do this. But we, we also had this other aspect that we wanted to try and do things as cost effective as possible and also try and um, help people who want to do it themselves. Um, so, Ted, I'm going to... With without a kit. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm, going, go I'm going to interrupt you. Can you slide left or right and show people the image behind you? Um, okay. Yeah, so this, this is a geodesic dome that uh, Ted and another colleague of mine built in Afton, Wyoming last year. Afton gets a lot of snow. This was a shot that the uh, uh, managers took of it middle of December, maybe January, I think. It's got four or five feet of snow on it. That's only half the door that you see. Uh, if it was a hoop house, it wouldn't be, um, it potentially could be crushing under that load. So um, that was one of the things that uh, we were very much interested in is providing a more durable type structure and still be cost effective at doing it. So we have a question from Megan and says, I'm going to use a zip tie dome with locking hub design that dramatically increases the structure stability. Are you familiar with those? We're familiar with them. We haven't built any. Um, we're stuck with wood um, just because of the structural. Obviously, wood is much stronger than than uh, PVC. So uh, what we've been doing is is a uh, uh, kind of a modified. All of the, all of the domes are built with wood struts that we've done. Wood struts, but they have PVC hubs. Yeah, they have PVC hubs. But they're, they're what's called Schedule 80 PVC, which is not the white PVC that you normally see uh, the, the uh, you know, at the hard store. Um, it's, a, it's twice the strength of, uh, of the regular PVC. So, so, so I unshared you so they could better see your hoop house. Yeah. With, all right, the geodome with the snow on it and Afton. So Ted, I want to um, I want you to address the five foot two V. What does this V stuff mean? No, oh, V we, is we needed the... we needed a mathematical challenge. We needed some yeah. mental simulation. That's why we started building domes. Yeah, well, you know, we we after a hundred hoop houses, you you kind of go, well, you know, what else can we do? Yeah, what else can we do? So. Um, with the with the five, this is just a five foot dome. I, I built it as a display model, and it's not meant. You know, you can't walk in it. It's it's just a small dome. It's but very I cute. To show show how to build a dome in a, uh, uh, you know how how easy. Well, I'm not going to say how easy it is, but um, but the 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 steps towards it. So really, you know, you build a base. The the thing that you wanted to show was. We wanted to be able to take this little thing to different places and show people how to skin it because that's yeah. the tricky part, right? That's the harder part. The, the building of the actual dome is pretty easy. I mean, in comparison to the skinning, because you got you don't have to think as much with building the actual dome as you do with skin. But um, so are you gonna are you gonna move? So I'll, move I'll go forward? through this. But a, a two V okay. dome basically has two different types of triangles. Two different sizes. Two different sizes of triangles, two different sizes of, of, of struts. And and if you want more complex and a more rounded dome structure, you can go all the way up to a 6V dome mm -hmm. or more, right? But a 2V dome, it's relatively simple. The math is relatively easy to figure out. Um, and it has 10 sides at the base. And so, uh, Ted, you talk and I'll move the slides along if you would like. Okay, okay. so let's go to the, that's <clears throat> basic base. And you just take and, you know, put the base together. So go to the next slide and we'll, we'll look at what it looks like. Next slide. That's what the base looks like. Um, you know, you bolt it together. All of the angles on the, the base are an 18 degree. And, you know, so it, it uh, um, so this so you have a 360 degrees is because you have 10 um, actually each each one is actually 36 degrees but the individual sections are 18 degree uh, angles so when the two come together it's a 30 the where you see the the blue uh, 
collar there, uh, that's 30 sixties on the on the on the, the base itself. So the, the collars are, are the the uh, schedule 80 PVCs. And mm -hmm. yeah, and on the on the base, you drill four holes, and they're they're uh, uh, we have a uh, a hanger bolt that goes into the wood, and then you just bolt it to the to the uh, the hub. There. So put in the next one, and we'll and also at the bottom, you see there's a white white board there. That's just a spacer board because otherwise, you know, you won't it it it's it doesn't sit flat the the hub doesn't sit flat. So okay, next, the next one. So and before you, this is just installing the hanger bolts. Yeah, this is just, yeah. And a hanger bolt has got threads on one side and, and uh, screw on the other side. So. so that might be easier to see here, but this yeah. is the installation. Yep. And okay. you just drill a, a quarter inch hole in the center of the, the, the end of the two by four and you you basically drill it in okay because of this unique tool it's right simple. here which is a driver yeah a driver specifically yeah, a driver. Hanger bolts, which we yes. highly recommend yes it's much easier using uh the tools you can buy them at, at uh cd fasteners or you know the hardware stores so there you see the the whole base now is is put on there and you can see the one is still left off and that's where the last of the the uh, uh, hubs would go. Um, and I've color coded this because I wanted you to see the, 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 there's two links and this is the longer of the two and it's cut at an 18 degree angle. So your angle there is 18 degrees. This angle um, right here. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, okay, if we go to the next slide, we'll, and there we have the other the other strut, which is uh, slightly smaller, um, and it's at a six. So the angles up at the where the red is are all sixteen degrees. Well, they're fifteen point eight five. But if you can do if you can do a fifteen point eight five, more power to you. But sixteen degrees is close enough. Sixteen uh, seems to work just fine. It's it works just fine. So. Yeah. Um, Okay, go to the next there. So it's an alternating there pattern. How, yeah, yeah. You got an alternating pattern of reds. Every other one is a red. Um, and if you go to the next one. Okay, now you, you have blues in between. So it's red, blue, red, blue, red, blue. <laughs> Pretty, pretty straightforward. You can't, you know, pretty hard to mess that up. So, so the, the blue, is that a different angle on, on your 18 cut? 18 degrees. No, nope, there's only two angles, 16 and 18, nothing else. Okay. Okay. So as you start going up, you notice that now you've got a, uh, your reds go to the, to the blues and you have like a, a, a five, five sided red spoked, uh, Part of that. Yeah, yeah. And when you look at it, if we go next slide, I think, yeah, you start to see it almost looks like you've got an hourglass on the blue and uh, um, the other looks more like a star or a pentagon is basically what it is. So, okay. So gradually we get closer and closer to the top and, and it starts looking more like a dome. And then now you've got a, a again the reds on the top, so it's it's the, the pattern the pattern is very simple um, and it and it goes together very quickly. Um, so about well, I can't remember how many of these we had built. Probably uh, the fourth one nine. last year. We <laughs> oh okay <laughs> we uh, did one at Ethity right. And I knew that the weather was going to turn bad the following day. Mm -hmm. From our arrival to completion, including the skinning, was nine hours. Right. Uh, and how big that, was that one? That particular one was 21 feet in diameter. Right. And that's the base. 
measurement, correct? Well, so it actually out of a out of an eight foot standard piece of lumber, you can get a 23 foot diameter dome. A 21 footer is just easier to build because of uh, ladder length. <laughs> Once you get to the top, it's uh, you got, if you're doing the 23, you got to have a bunch of tall people by the time you're done. And the other thing is, is that, um, you know, you get as you get longer on the two by four, you know, the, the, the amount of weight that it can carry becomes less. So, and it, and it seems like a, a, a 21 foot dome is a, is a really nice size. It, it, plus it gives you a little bit of stability on the ends because oftentimes you'll buy a two by four and the ends are not that great. I mean, you've got to cut off a little bit just to kind of right. uh, get away from the, the ugly part of the two by four. It's got splits, it's got, you know, all kinds of stuff, especially unless you're using a, uh, you know, uh, a really nice fur two by four, you know, some of the pine or the, the hemp fur, it's just, they're just not as nice two by fours. They're just not as, they're not as good. So do you want to tackle so, skinning? Skinning, I think, well, we start on the next one here. Uh, next slide, I think we start skinning. I think people yeah. find this um, difficult to believe that we don't skin individual triangles. Um, no, I mean, that's, that's one way of doing it. I mean, it is one I'm, way of doing it, but it to, yeah. to us, because we've had experience doing the high tunnels and domes and understand how this plastic moves, um, it, it's a whole lot easier to do it in one piece than individual pieces. The, the, first, the, the first structure that we were involved with, um, the, it was a kit that was ordered. Um, it was, uh, the instructions were very difficult to understand and the cover didn't show up with it. So the, the folks who purchased that kit had to cover it separately on their own and they, they covered each individual triangle and it took a really long time for them to finish the project. Um, like I say, with one sheet, we can do it. It usually takes four hours just to skin it. Um, so Ted, if you want to, okay, uh, before how you much jump it, into that? Before what's that? Jump, oh, okay. Before you jump okay. into that, we have a question. Okay. Kyla asked, does the durability of this type of structure outweigh having less growing space in comparison to a hoop house or high tunnel? So there's 514 square feet, I think, or something like that inside a 21 foot dome. Um, and that's the growing space. That's, that's the entire growing space, but you're going to need some space for pathways and those types of things, right? Um, you can build raised beds all the way around the outside and then build a keyhole type structure in the middle. And so I might be off on the math. Ted's checking me, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna... Uh... Uh, check your math. 500, actually, the, that's a 25-foot dome, but uh, let's oh, see. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll give you what the, the let's see, spherical radius is. While he's five. doing that, is that cover the same woven stuff that you use on the hoop houses? Yes. yes. Thank you. It is the same it's woven polyethylene product. Was I close, Ted? Um, just a second here. I'm pulling it up, and it, it says that yeah, hold it. Where's the square footage? So uh, it's 388. It's 388 square feet. So what Ted is looking at, um, there are actually some good online resources to figure out the strut length, the size of the structure. All you got to do is plug in a few numbers, and it does everything for you. Which yep. you know, I, I have to admit that I am mathematically challenged. And when Ted said domes, I was uh, a little bit uh, uh, less than thrilled than he was to start this project. But now that how I see that they go together, they're really easy to build and put together. So. And they're incredibly it, in comparison to a hoop house. I mean, they're just no, they're, they're night and day. I mean, so Ky Kyla, to get back to your question, um, if I had, if I was limited on space, uh, one of these types of structures may be better for your situation. Um, I, I, I'm, I know where you're at. You know, you don't get a lot of snow load. You do have a lot of wind there. 
Um, uh, so uh, it's, it's a trade-off. It depends on what you would like to do. A 21 foot diameter dome costs using lo mostly, mostly locally sourced materials, it's about $1,700. Okay, so another question. Uh, Dara uh, asked, is there a way to work with more environmentally friendly materials for greenhouses and domes? Um, the, the amount of single use plastic for skins for greenhouse cultivation feels a bit daunting to me. Do you guys know of it? So single use to me implies one season. We're getting 10 or 11 years out of these pieces of plastic. And that's why you want to go with the woven plastic because you can extend how long that plastic stays on the structure. Yeah, this, this particular product is very durable. And if you don't have um, uh, places to wear, since we're attaching it to the dome on every surface that you possibly can, there are no wear surfaces, uh, we don't know how long it'll last. So um, 12 years? Yeah, I, if it doesn't, I would be surprised. Yeah. So, because he, at, on, a, on a, uh, uh, a hoop house, after about eight or nine years, you start to see wear on the, the fiber reinforced ribs. Um, depending upon who's making that fiber reinforced too. We right. A, we did yeah. run into one company that, and we're not, I probably shouldn't say who it is, so I won't. We, we have a list uh, of recommended suppliers available. Yes. And, and one that probably I would not ever use again, but you yeah. know. Yeah, if you, um, you contact us later on, we can we can fill you in. Um, mm -hmm. So we, I, I think we probably ought to keep moving, Ted. But yep. um, uh, most uh, on on the larger structures, we don't staple every single strut. But I'm guessing you did. Just I did just because I could, and okay. I was working alone. So. Right. Um, well, but it 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 uh, it helps to be able to attach, and it was a little windy the day I was doing it, so um, the uh, the staples came in handy. Um, okay. But basically, you're 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 trying it uh, as tight as you can on all the triangles, and so you know you you're in this case I was stapling and pulling, and and the nice thing about um, the staple is, is that you can kind of put it and then I, like I got the whole top of the dome done with the top top uh, layer uh, without uh, any help. I mean, now I wouldn't recommend that on, on a 21 foot dome. I don't either. Uh, <laughs> or a 12 foot dome because I've done 12 foot, I've done 14 foot, I've done, you know, we did the 16, well we didn't skin the 16 so uh, but we did the 18, and we did a 21, and we did a 22. So we've done multiple different sizes, and the only difference between any of those sizes was the length of the the strut itself, so, and that's it. Everything and, else was the same. And so to make the attachment permanent, we use a lath strip with screws set through it, and then that goes on top of the thin edge of each triangle. Right. Okay. And and that, that last strip, I, I cut it a half an inch uh, because, I, you know, uh, typically on the, on the hoop houses, we do three eighths, but half inch seemed to be a nice compromise. It wasn't too bulky and it, and it uh, doesn't split as, or as easily. So, so, uh, so, so time out, time out. Okay. You cut your own last strip on a table saw, right? Yep. Just cut it, yep. set the table saw up to a half inch and and ripped some two by fours. That's all. And this was out of scrap two by four that I had gotten from, uh, you know, when I was making the, the, uh, the struts themselves. But you're obviously on a larger one, you're going to need uh, much bigger uh, lengths there. But. And if okay, you're going to have to hold on, hold on. Uh, we got a couple questions. So Kyla asked, okay. what size is the dome in this example that we're showing? This is a five foot, five foot dome, and it's purely as a demo. Uh, so that I could, I wanted to be able to uh, show how to skin it. And in, so I in all reality, out, yeah. this would make a really good doghouse. Yes. In the winter. <laughs> and as you can see, my garage in the background is very messy from 
from having me all equipment all over the place. <laughs> so I'll, I'll move on. And then yeah. hold on real quick, Megan. You asked the question. It cut out. Uh, how many years? Uh, how many years for what? Uh, were you talking about the the plastic or something else? So if you could answer this, Megan. Oh, in the how many years is this plastic going to last? Probably ten to twelve years. Yep. So the plastic on the dome. So ten yeah. to twelve years, possibly longer, depending on how well it's secured. But we just don't know. Right. Yeah. Okay. We, so we, we have this material on a hoop house in Torrington that's been there since 2010. Well, so it, and, and it's only warranted for six years. So uh, it has outlived its functionality at this point. I mean, it's still functional, but uh, it's still, at some point it'll need to be replaced. My speculation is on the geodesic domes, that the plastic is going to wear out because of UV radiation before it just wears apart, right? So, yeah. so good, good point. Um, this particular woven product is treated with a UV stabilizer as compared to other types of plastic that you can just buy at a hardware store or something. Um, so it will last longer than one use. All, all, all greenhouse plastics are, are UV stable, so, but. Uh, some are better than others. That's we had a question from Facebook that was along the line of light waves and stuff going through different materials. Um, it's from Timothy. Um, in terms of filtering out parts of the light uh, electromagnetic spectrum, what are the characteristics of different materials available and which are better or worse for plant growth? Well, this, this is kind of an interesting one. This They did some... Uh, studies in Texas on this particular material, and they found that plants grow faster. And that they also, there's no shade or less shading in a, a structure that's covered with this. And it's purely because the, the, the light's being uh, bounced around so much with, uh, uh, you know, the, the fiber reinforced uh, part of it. The, the other thing is, is that you do get a less transmission. I, I, Jeff, I, I'm trying to remember, it's either 85 or 87% of light will go through. I thought, I, I, thought the, I thought this particular material was like 95 light, 95% light yeah, transmission. Depending upon the, the, the manufacturer, yeah, you're gonna get different ones, but. One, one uh, of the things that we've noticed with this particular woven product, as Ted said, once the structure is built and you walk inside, there's no shading, there, there's no shadow. You walk in, you can't see, you can't find your shadow because light is just bouncing all around on the inside of there. And what happens is there's, in our environment, in Wyoming, there's a 300 days of sunny days, right? Um, there's actually, the plants are getting too much light and what happens, uh, tomatoes and peppers, they'll, the leaves will start to curl up and it looks like you have a disease of some type. So in order to get around that, what we are recommending is people put a 30% shade cloth over the entire structure just to cut down a little bit of the amount of light coming in. And you'll notice that those tomatoes will open back up and they'll be a little bit more productive. And so it's, there's, some thing, there's some tricks to it that uh, you have to do. Okay. All right. So, so Megan has a question. Okay. The snap tight plastic securing pieces used on kit domes when you skin, I'm curious what you think of them, of that snap tight. And then when skinning without lathe on the outside. Um, Jeff, I, don't, <laughs> I, I haven't used those particular ones. Yeah. So, so I, I'm assuming that you're using the, Megan, you're using the clip type pieces that go around the pipe. Jeremiah, is that is that the material yes. that you used? No, that's not the material I used. No. Okay, so um, I, I don't have any experience with the clip type attachment products for the poly, just because um, I have a tendency to over engineer stuff, and I want the access to those uh, horizontal purlins to make attachment points for the plastic. 
Uh, it also adds to the rigidity of the structure. And on these larger commercial structures, if you live in a place where the wind blows a lot and you don't have that purlin side, um, the, the structure will start to caterpillar on you. Um, so which increases wear and loss. So I, I can't really address your question. Um, I like to have that material as tight as possible and the structure as rigid as possible. She lives in Casper, if that helps with the question. Wind. A lot of wind. wind. Yep. So the more secure, the better you're going to be. Yeah, definitely. So you go, as you can see, I, I'm continuing to fold over. On the top one, I only had one fold that I had to do. Um, on the second rung, or the second one coming down, there was actually five that I had to make five folds um, in order to, to get it tighter. And so really what, know, we're that's, kind of, what we're kind of doing is pulling, pulling attaching, yep. folding, attaching, putting the lath on, and then cutting where appropriate, or cutting where appropriate before you put the lath on. Yeah. And, Oops. you know, I, I, there, because I was doing it alone, I couldn't get it as, uh, quite as tight as I wanted it, but it was still pretty tight by the time it was done. Sure. And now the bottom one, it took me having to, to fold over, you know, uh, nine, nine times. So, so the total number was, was 15 folds from top to bottom. Um, you know, so it, it does require some, you know, some, uh, some thought in, um, you know, in this case, I screwed up. I, I folded the wrong way on the previous one. So I had to do a, a side fold uh, or a, a horizontal fold. Wait a minute. Uh, we, we don't screw up. Possible. We just make modifications, Ted. We, yeah, we, I had to modify my, my original plan. So <laughs> looks like a mild kind of origami with plastic to me. <laughs> uh, kind of, yes. Oh, that's the last slide. So, um, so basically, it's, you know, pull and fold and... Um, one of the things that we talk about is the number of people it may take to, uh, let me unshare here, uh, to, uh, to do these types. Me, that's what it looked like in the end. Um, when you're attaching the plastic, probably, and on a windy day, no more than four people. Uh, the most challenging day I've had was in um, earlier this year, uh, we did a project in Wheatland and we had 42 mile an hour winds. So um, it, it can be done. It's challenging, uh, but it's, it's going to take some time to, to do it. So the, the person who, uh, who asked about strength, strength. Um, I'm, st I'm standing on top of that dome, that little five footer. Yeah, so. but you don't weigh nothing, Ted. I, <laughs> I should have been sitting in to give it a real test. <laughs> so Megan asked a question. Uh, do you guys have any ideas of how to secure tightly to a PVC dome? Oh, no. Oh. Oh. I do not. Yeah. Um. Oh, wonder if she meant hoop houses. No, I Maybe think she's stones. she's talking about okay. the 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 um, using the collars and PVC structure. I do not know how. I don't have any idea how to attach the cover to a PVC style dome. And I've thought about that too, and it's like I don't know. I don't know how the uh, zip tie domes are doing it. Um, they come as a kit, so I guess they should. Um, have some way that they're hopefully they come with out. really good instructions. Yeah. Jeff, we have a side question and I accidentally hit that I answered it, so we probably need to answer it. They're asking if that was shade cloth behind your head inside your high tunnel, and it looks like shade cloth to me. Well, it functions like shade cloth. That is my roll up side, and um, it is a uh, it's actual actually window screening. So in addition, I, I, I'm an entomologist. I like to keep out the bugs out of my, uh, out of my high tunnel. So um, uh, on my roll-up side, I have window screening on the inside. And then after we get to a point where we leave the sides rolled up, I will put 30% shade cloth over the top of it. 
But the shade cloth is on the inside. Shade cloth is on the outside. On the outside. You could put it on the inside. Great. Okay, I got two more questions for you guys, but I wanted to make sure you guys had any other last thoughts you had. I have one thing. So um, in the current situation that we're in, as far as uh, inability to travel around and do workshops, I have been um, creating parts and pieces in my shop, filming the entire process. And at some point in the near future, uh, when I get that uh, video edited. It's my intention that Ted and I will have meetings similar to this so that we can actually show you how to prepare the parts and pieces. And then um, hopefully when travel restrictions are um, removed, we'll be able to get out and do some workshops where we can actually film the assembly and film the skinning. And then we will continue to have uh, this type of a venue where we can come back and talk about it so that those of you who are interested in this type of um, structure, but need a little bit, uh, a little bit more guidance on how to build it, uh, we're gonna try and provide that to you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, um, the only thing I would say is, is that to, to build all the parts and pieces, um, and if you're doing it alone, it's going to take you a day, um, you know, because that's, you know, the, and if you're going to somehow protect it with uh, uh, paint or, or uh, eco preservative of some kind, um, you know, you allow yourself a day to do that or half a day to do that anyway, because, it, you know, it, it, it does take some time to build it um, and it, you will need a miter saw and you will need, you know, a good drill and, and, a, and a driver and, you know, drill bits and drills and a bit. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take a lot, you know, but, but you do need some of the, you know, the basic equipment. Um, yeah, I guess the last thing is I do have a materials list for a 21 foot dome. I don't have the instructions, the written instructions on how to do all, prep all the parts and pieces. That's why we're doing this video series. Um, so uh, I do have some very rough, a very rough draft of how to assemble it. Um, so we'll, we'll try to coach you if you're interested. Right. So, and, uh, and the other thing is, is that, that, uh, um, you know, if you got a garage, you can build one. <laughs> you can so, build it outside too, Ted. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's a little it's a little nicer if you have a garage <laughs> to build the parts. Okay, Jenny, do you have any other questions? I have two left. I had one outstanding, which kind of goes with one that you have. Um, so the folks asking about your opinion on a couple different systems. And um, our question from Facebook's asked, what about quick build caterpillar tunnels? And then I think Jeremiah has one. Yeah, uh, Megan asked, I am curious if the panelists are familiar with Wallapinis. Wallapinis? A friend has built one in South Dakota. Please know where he's asking for the Q&A. So Ted, do you want to tackle the uh, caterpillar tunnel? Um, you know they're they're really easy to build because they're usually they use a uh, um, a one inch or I think I've seen them as, as much as a one and a half. But typically you see them with a one inch PVC. It's they're really inexpensive. Um, they're they just basically drape the uh, uh, plastic over top of the the, the hoops that you um, put into the ground and and you know and then they secure the ends and uh, they go up very fast and they're you know they're they're typically not the not they might I, from the ones I've seen they're about five foot high um, you know that you can't really walk in them really well but they the uh, early on in the season, they're really nice to get things going and, and they're cheap. I've seen them in use in Colorado uh, at the uh, experiment station over the top of raspberries uh, in the fall. Um, so yeah, 
can you use them? Certainly, they have their place. Um, but again, if you get snow early, you're gonna have to take all that down and and uh, store it someplace. Wind. Yeah, they don't. They don't typically leave them up. So. Yeah. Wind may be an issue as well. It just depends on how you're trying to produce and how far into the season you want to get. So Linda put a question in. Uh, uh, and asked uh, on Facebook showed that there's a class in Worland in June to build these. Is that also UW extension and is it still happening? So it is still happening. <laughs> UW extension can't travel to get there. Uh, we've contracted with someone else to do it, um, who we've been working with. Actually, the gentleman that's in Ted's picture over his right hand shoulder there. Um, and um, uh, it, it will happen. Contact Caitlin Youngquist at uh, Worland to um, participate. At the Worland Extension Office, yep. Yeah. We'll show you the contact information on the website, how you can reach her at the end of the show. Okay, so our last question, and, and uh, this comes in from Megan, and I think you guys have found your new calling and career path, but do Ted and Jeff hire out on Bill? <laughs> on, on Zoom? No, on building. I'm building. They want to oh, hire you to build. It. <laughs> oh, um, uh, the short answer? No, you couldn't afford us. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we're here. I mean, we're here to help you. We'll try and answer all the questions we can and, and things like that. As we've stated uh, several times, they're more familiar with the wood structures. The the PVC structures don't have a personal experience with so. And the only the only other thing about the builds is that uh, you know we've we've done them mainly for well in fact for the domes anyway they've either been nonprofits or schools or um, you know at this point. And our main work uh, our main goal of the workshop is if people attend that they take away the knowledge that they can go to their own place and build their own and utilize the structures right. how they see fit. So. So another question came in real quick. Claudia asks, are there problems with moose and elk and other animals trying to get in these structures? <laughs> Oddly enough, um, we've had reports of deer get into them, even the ones that we have roll-up sides in where the roll-up is higher than normal. Uh, to deter that, we suggest um, hanging up uh, baling twine uh, through the opening. That seems to keep them out. Um, moose and elk, I do not have that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're curious and if it's green in there, I can't say they wouldn't. <laughs> I would think with that opaque plastic material, they probably can't see through it quite as well to know that there's something good inside to get to. So Eight, on a, guess. Yeah, on a dome structure, I don't think you're going to run into that issue because nothing's open unless you leave the door open. If you're going to put a door and, and intend to leave it open, maybe put a screen door on it. A physical deterrent is probably your best bet. Um, if it's a high tunnel with the roll-up ends, open doors, stuff like that, again, like, like Jeff put in that screen, it's just window screen as a mesh, uh, something physical like that can in a way deter them from going, but if they feel like they want to get in there, mm -hmm. especially if it's a male with antlers, it will make a hole and get in. They're a large enough animal probably could force their way in. So, yeah. Yeah. With that, we, we have had a... Fabulous uh, discussion. Ted, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jeff? One, last, one last thing here. Yeah, um, yeah. To keep some of the smaller animals, do a split door so that you can open the top part and leave the bottom closed. I mean, if you want to, if you got rabbits and, you know, whatever, trying to get into your hoop house or your dome, yeah, do a split Good. door. It won't, it won't keep the deer out. they will just walk right over it. Yeah, no, perfect. Yeah, the great, great. Thank you. Again, thank you, Ted, for joining us. Jeff, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Uh, we're here. We're, we want to support you. Uh, Jeff's going to get those materials put together as quickly as he can and professionally as he can and get those out to everyone. Uh, and so, but touch base with us. So last thing, we always wrap up our show with barnyardsandbackyards.com, that URL there that you're seeing. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, for all those resources that we talked about, this is a web web page to go to. We're also going to put those uh, resources and materials on this website at this URL, but under the Barnyards and Backyards Live uh, for your benefit. The recorded show, so if you want to watch this show again, 
If you want to watch past shows, those are going to be posted on this, on this URL, on this website as well. And then future shows will also be listed there. So if you want to see what's upcoming and as we progress uh, with this Barnyards and Backyards Live. The next thing, so uh, contacting your extension office. So that Whirlin extension office, if you go to this website, this URL will take you to this website and has a list of all extension offices in the state. We have one in every county and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. So please find us, come help us, uh, or come find us to help you is even better. <laughs> um, if you really wanna hire out for Jeff and Ted, they might accept that. But uh, the last thing we have is an evaluation. We wanna hear from you. Uh, so for those that are on Zoom, we, uh, you'll be prompted in your internet browser for an evaluation. For those of you on Facebook, Jenny Thompson has put that in on uh, the comments section there. So please take time, fill that out. Let us know what you think. Uh, it really helps us uh, steer this show. So with that, thank you everyone. Have a great weekend and we'll see you again. Thanks thank everybody. You